Bioneers. Catchy name. For reference, Bioneers is, according to Wikipedia, yes, I know I'm being lazy, uh, it's described as a nonprofit organization based in New Mexico and California that promotes practical and innovative solutions to global environmental and biocultural challenges. So, climate science, environmental science, and I guess bioethical subject matter. This video is from their annual conference, which was held earlier this year in September, which, quote, highlights the work of scientific and social innovators and helps support, nurture, and propagate their ideas and models. Great, I am ready to be educated. So, let's begin. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Alliance for Climate Education fellow, Keon Martin. Good afternoon, y'all. How's it going? Okay. This is already interesting. Um, hey, I'm Keon Martin, and I'm an alumni of the Alliance for Climate Education. I identify as a mixed-race, Iranian-American, non-binary, trans-femme, community organizer, abolition... Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, At a conference based around scientific and cultural challenges, I would think you would lead off with your academic credentials. Instead, we get what sounds like a very well-practiced litany of words that tells us nothing about who you are, simply what you are. This isn't promising. <laughs> Community organizer, abolitionist, and freedom fighter from San Jose, California. Um, freedom fighter. Sounds a bit militant for a bioneer. I want to preface what I'm about to say um, by just saying, naming that I'm going to go to some sort of vulnerable and intense places. Um, and I really want y'all to like react how you feel you want to react, right? I consider myself a really like snap positive and moan positive person. So if you really love what I'm saying, if you really hate what I'm saying, whatever, go for it. <laughs> um. Snap positive, moan positive. I think I think I understand the first one, as snapping is the modern, safer version of clapping for those with fragile psyches. But moan positive? That's a new one for me. So as organizers and movement makers, we spend a lot of our time talking about our personal narratives and how to tell them. Uh, each time I share my story or talk about my experience as an organizer, I try to frame it a little differently. Why do you frame it differently each time? I can't imagine your story or the aggregate of your experiences changes all that much between retellings. Just seems odd to me. Odder still that you would admit that out loud sounds more like a trick of the trade than something you would tell people. Today, I'd like to start not this fall with the start of my freshman year at UC Berkeley, not in 2015 with the beginning of my work with the Alliance for Climate Education, not even in 1998 with my birth. Um, today, my story begins in 1979. Your story begins 19 years before you were born. Okay, well, you said you were an Iranian-American, so my guess would be this is about your parents? It was in this year that the people of Iran mobilized in a revolution that overthrew the Shah, an imperial dictator put in place by the United States and Britain. Um, while the revolution was truly complex and nuanced... Complex and nuanced? Why do I have a feeling we're about to receive heavy portions of apologetics sugar-coated with some convenient omissions of fact? Also, yes, the Shah was a dictator. But who took over after the revolution? The Ayatollah Khomeini, the supreme leader. He ruled from 1979 until his death in 1989 and oversaw the execution of thousands of dissidents in that time. Is all that included within your nuance? I did one thing that was unthinkably powerful. It served as a bold act of resistance against global capitalism, imperialism, and white supremacy. I always hear imperialism used as a pejorative, but its meaning is about as ubiquitous a concept as you can find when it comes to conducting the business of any modern nation. A policy of extending a country's power and influence through diplomacy or military force. 
all nations seek to extend their power and influence through diplomacy or military action. Uh, understanding myself as a part of this legacy of resistance gives me power that cannot be removed by all of the systems that try to take power away from me. Understanding yourself as a part of the legacy of resistance. So, inserting yourself as being associated with events that occurred decades before you were born, and wearing them as a badge of pride. Sounds really familiar. Me, I tend not to take credit nor blame for things I have not done, but maybe I'm just unique. In order to begin to understand ourselves and the current moment in which we exist, we must contextualize this moment in the long histories of white supremacy, colonialism, and patriarchy, as well as the legacies of survival, resistance, and resilience of marginalized communities. I always get a little wary whenever someone says that I must think a particular way. So we must contextualize this moment in terms of white supremacy, colonialism, and patriarchy. Because if we don't contextualize things within those concepts, you would quickly find your career as a perpetual victim coming to a close. And this is the first mention of patriarchy, so I assume feminism is entwined in there as well. <laughs> this means that we cannot look at violence against transgender and gender nonconforming people today without looking at the colonialism that imposed the gender binary on indigenous peoples of the Americas and the global south. How? How did imperialism create the gender binary? How did a method of international power swapping establish a biological reality? And whether you are transgender or gender nonconforming, I am sorry to say you are still either male or female. How you decide to express yourself is entirely up to you, but wearing a Napoleon costume does not make you Napoleon. We cannot have conversations about family planning and climate without talking about the forced sterilization of women of color. Family planning, climate, and the forced sterilization of women of color. Okay, how do these things relate to each other? I am honestly curious to hear the answer to that one, seriously. You've taken a lot of time to say a lot of things, but you have yet to explain anything. <laughs> Is the forced sterilization of women of color something you normally laugh at? Our lives and our movements do not exist outside of these histories. The United States, the state of California, the city of San Rafael, and this very conference are all part of ongoing projects of settler colonialism, white supremacy, and cis heteropatriarchy. Whoa, 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 whoa. This very conference is part of the colonialism, white supremacy, and heteropatriarchy. I think you have just convicted your entire audience of participating in grievous crimes. Let's see how they respond. Combating. <laughs> Given all of the applause you've been provided prior to this, that was a pretty tepid reaction. I think most of them might still be slightly in shock. Combating the intensely violent impacts of these histories is certainly not an easy task. Many large climate organizations seem to think that a justice-driven approach looks like intentional outreach and diversification of their work. I'm here to tell you that this is not only inadequate given the scale of these systems of oppression, but that this kind of approach to justice often looks like tokenization and repeats violent histories of exploitation of physical, emotional, and political labor of people of color. Okay, I have listened to that portion of the video about six times now, trying to decipher exactly what is being said there. But all I come away with is a salad of buzzwords and pseudo-intellectual double talk. If anyone can provide me a more accurate, or at least humorous interpretation of it, please do so in the comments. Um, injustice does not only look like an absence of marginalized voices. Injustice also looks like telling people of color to call in and not call out because our rage is not deemed productive and we must protect white feelings. I'm not exactly sure what he means by call in and call out. I'm guessing speaking up instead of remaining quiet but I certainly understand the accusatory condescension towards white feelings because we're dealing with a racial supremacist. Injustice looks like expecting marginalized people to take on all of the labor of creating your anti-oppressive climate justice messaging. So don't expect marginalized people to do your work for you. Is that what you're saying? Anti-oppressive climate justice messaging. 
What does that even mean? And aren't you a fellow at the Alliance for Climate Education? Aren't you a community activist? If you're flatly not going to do that kind of work, what kind of work do you actually do? Injustice looks like inviting a non-binary trans femme to facilitate a workshop at an event and then expecting them to use one of your binary gendered restrooms. Was that another dig at the very conference at which you are speaking? They didn't have a specialized bathroom just for you? Gosh, how do you live with such hardships? <laughs> Injustice looks like asking a queer person of color to speak at a conference and not compensating them for their emotional labor. Um... Your emotional labor. What exactly is the exchange rate on feelings against the dollar these days? You've classified the conference you are speaking at as a racist, colonial, binary bathroomed, and apparently emotionally cheap endeavor. I have not seen this level of entitlement on display under such circumstances in quite a while, honestly. The logic of inclusion of marginalized people is also flawed in its assumption that movements for climate justice are actually being led by cisgender, white, heterosexual people. In fact, people of color, are queer, trans, and gender nonconforming people, femmes, low-income folks, and people with disabilities have been leading these movements since the very beginning. Right. White, straight people are inferior and unnecessary. Queer, trans, and non-conforming people of color are superior. By audience applause, you have turned this into an apparently well-received hate rally. Congratulations. Instead of seeking to include marginalized people in their spaces, I urge dominant climate organizations to find ways to challenge the very systems that give them the platform and the power that they have. What systems? What power? Do you have an argument? Do you have a point? What is it you think you deserve to just have handed to you if you complain long enough? What we need isn't to be included in dominant organizing spaces. What we need is a redistribution of power and resources that allows us to continue resisting, surviving, and thriving in a world that wants to destroy us. So you want all of their power and resources without having to be involved with them. That sounds fair. Um. <laughs> For discussing such grim topics as sterilization, violence, and personal survival, you sure laugh a lot. I stand here before you as a non-binary, trans-feminine person of color in a particular settler colony in a particular time where my existence is constantly under attack. Yes, look at how attacked you are, being the featured speaker at an annual conference and receiving applause for every buzzword you drop and every passive-aggressive insult you belt out at the very people putting their hands together for you. Tell me more about how horrible anyone whose skin or sexuality operates differently than yours is. We live in a moment when trans and gender nonconforming people of color are being killed on a regular basis, when the average life expectancy for a trans femme of color is less than 35 years. I have no idea how accurate those claims are, and you provide no sources. I am certain that transgendered people are murdered each year. But at the risk of sounding callous, what does that have to do with climate? This entire talk so far has been about you, running down the various aspects of your ethnic and sexual makeup and pointing out how each of them is a hardship you're bravely standing up against. Is this speech anything more than a verbal act of masturbation? It is much harder for me to show up for the revolution when I fear death every time I set foot outside of my home. And yet, we continue to lead the fight for justice every single day. Um, <laughs> Don't break your arm patting yourself on the back. Just take a moment to look at the makeup of the audience. I find it very interesting, given our speaker's attitude. And so I ask you to look at the violence being experienced by communities across the country and the world, not as something for your consumption or your pity, but rather as a call to action. Um, to the queer and trans femmes of color in this space, surviving, resisting every day, I see you, I feel you, I love you. Um, your presence in these spaces is a powerful and valuable thing. Okay, you have now praised those people who look and operate like you do. Now comes the inevitable rejoinder against those who are not like yourself. Those who are the other. To all the white folks, the cis folks, the hetero folks, give more, try harder. Challenge yourself to show up for our struggle in tangible and meaningful ways. Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme, 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every stanza kind of rhymes with the last one. You do not need to wait for the state to redistribute power and wealth. You can do it right now. Um, Are you going to pass the collection plate around? Are you accepting donations out in the lobby after the show? What kind of privilege and comfort are you willing to give up in support of our resistance? <laughs> Why don't you go out and earn your own privilege and comfort? But I guess complaining and shaming others has gotten you this far, so if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? While you may not have played an active role in the creation of these oppressive systems, you continue to benefit from them. Your complicity is violence for which you must hold yourself accountable. Yeah, all you in the audience who don't look like me, or sleep with people the way I do, you're all violent, greedy, racist homophobes. And remember to vote Clinton! When we talk about lives being on the line, it is not a metaphor, it is not an exaggeration. Black, brown, queer, trans, femme, disabled, poor lives are being lost every day, and until you are giving everything you can to support our resistance, you're not doing enough. Thanks. So this is how liberty dies. With thunderous applause. As far as I can tell, that entire speech can be summed up thusly. I am a victim for the several aspects of my makeup, both chosen and not chosen. Give me money I don't have to work for. Anyone who isn't like me is a terrible person by default. I think that about covers it. As always, thank you for watching.